the previous speakers, I would like to congratulate and thank EERI, the ERI New York chapter, GEAR, and all of the people who have come here to listen to us talk and say a few things about we, what we've learned uh, with the Canterbury earthquake sequence. My talk today is going to start with this iconic picture of New York City to remind us at the corner of Wall Street and William Street back in the 1920s that we not only have an infrastructure, but we have a pretty crowded infrastructure, and we have an infrastructure that's pretty critical and also fragile. Fading that particular image out, the topics I'm going to talk about today are the Canterbury earthquake sequence to sort of put things in perspective, picking up on a couple of issues that were brought up about by previous speakers. I'm going to talk about data sets and infrastructure. I'm going to talk about U.S. applications of what we've learned in New Zealand. Talk a little bit about Hurricane Sandy because the characteristics of regional disasters have a lot in common. And some of the things that we learn from infrastructure in New Zealand associated with earthquakes also involves increased vulnerability to flooding and also involves characteristics that were learned in New York City with respect to Hurricane Sandy. And then finally, some final overview lessons learned. So let's just start with a couple of facts about the Canterbury earthquake sequence. Um, about 1,500 commercial buildings demolished in Christchurch, literally transformed. About 52,000 residences damaged. And about 30 billion US dollars, 40 billion New Zealand dollars, um, about 20% of gross domestic product. And also massive liquefaction and infrastructure damage. Uh, four major earthquakes in the Canterbury earthquake sequence. So we're talking about a community that's being traumatized again and again. And so there's something interesting in terms of the impact of that effect, or the, or the liquefaction and the ground shaking on the infrastructure, but also something very important about the way people responded to it, the human dimension. Uh, and then here's some pictures of what the liquefaction looked like from the 4th September 2010 earthquake, about 52 kilometers of square kilometers of area affected by severe liquefaction. The 22nd February 2011, about 96 square kilometers, and then about 91 square kilometers for the 13th of June 2011. Many people don't really understand what these dimensions mean. You probably haven't been to Christchurch. You're not sure about what the aerial extent is. So just to put this in perspective, here's the shape files for the liquefaction from the 22nd February earthquake, and here's San Francisco. And if we move those on to San Francisco, the extent of liquefaction is one Frisco large. This, by the way, if we superimposed it on New York City, would cover a few of the boroughs. Okay. Christ Church liquefaction is not only a story about liquefaction, as John mentioned, it's a story about water. Now, some of that water is actually coming from broken pipelines, which will be damaged by the liquefaction. And in this location, Bexley, which is in the eastern suburbs, close to the ocean, uh, we also had uh, uh, Hartesian wells, which were broken and also gave off a lot of water. The point is that so much liquefaction has occurred in Bexley that it's now a meter lower than it used to be, and the greatest threat to Bexley is from flooding. In fact, we saw manifestations of this increased flood vulnerability in 2014 when severe flooding affected many neighborhoods in Christchurch and caused great personal uh, uh, concern and trauma for the people there. Some, so, some unique characteristics of the Canterbury earthquake sequence. Impact of four main earthquakes within 16 months, multiple recurrence of ground motion and liquefaction at the same sites for different moment magnitudes and sort distances, disruption of the same geographically distributed infrastructure several times, multiple impacts on underground infrastructure, damage and disruption to modern infrastructure of a moderately sized city. So the city of Christchurch is, in its metropolitan extent, about the same size as Savannah, Georgia. The interesting part about it being moderate is that it was still examinable, explorable. It wasn't so large like something like the Tohoku earthquake that many different people are telling many different stories and you're missing many times the integration of what's going on. Even though it is 
moderate sized, it has the same modern infrastructure that we find in developed countries, including New York City and the world. And we also can scalable, it's scalable, we can actually take the lessons learned from this moderate, smaller size city and scale them out because it's the same type of infrastructure we're using. The other unique characteristic is that our colleagues in New Zealand developed an open source, open access data sets. And these data sets have really transformed the way in which we look at the impact of disasters on infrastructure and have valuable lessons for looking at infrastructure and for asset management in the future. So let's talk about data sets and infrastructure. Canterbury Geotechnical Database, Strong Motion Database, and Infrastructure Database. If we look at the Canterbury Geotechnical Database, open access, open to anybody who wants to use it, about 12,000 borehole records, 26,000 CPT records, 1,000 piezometers, 6,000 laboratory tests, accessed by citizens of 37 countries, and accessed multiple times by each of 3,900 different users. This is a global data set that is allowing us to look at a level of granularity that we've never been able to uh, in terms of spatially integrated infrastructure. And then a dense ground motion array, uh, Canterbury earthquake uh, strong motion array of about 20, 25 instruments. If we put that into the, the GeoNet uh, in, in New Zealand, we could get as many as 50 stations to look at in terms of motions affecting Christchurch and the surroundings. Uh, mapped and geocoded areas of liquefaction. Geocoded repairs for thousands of kilometers of different pipelines and power cables. Damage assessments for over uh, 140,000 residential properties and damage assessments for hundreds of commercial and public buildings. And then on top of that, remote sensing. It's the way in which you can combine all of these extraordinary data sets that liberate you to see and manage things that were never heretofore been able to be managed and understood in the way that they are now understood after the Canterbury earthquake sequence. So let's just talk, start with the LIDAR. There was high resolution LIDAR flown at five meters and four meter intervals. This is very high resolution. You can get differential horizontal movement from this LIDAR. You can get differential vertical settlement. You can divide the vertical settlement by the distance between those points, five meter points, and you get an angular distortion. We know in civil engineering that structures respond to differential settlement and differential lateral movement. Typically, we characterize those in terms of angular distortion and lateral ground strain. We can do that same thing for the pipeline networks, for example, in Christchurch. This is a picture of the LIDAR flight paths in green, the liquefaction areas that were mapped uh, in white for the 22nd February earthquake. And then superimposed on that is the pipeline system, oops, and superimposed, if I can go back here, on that are the pipeline repair locations. So from that, we can actually correlate the pipeline repairs per kilometer as a damage index with respect to both the differential vertical settlement expressed as angular distortion and lateral ground strains. When you do that, we find out that if you look at those correlations for one variable, you get actually very good relationships and we actually can combine the two because obviously something like pipelines are damaged by both lateral strains and different differential vertical movements. So when we combine these for asbestos cement, cast iron pipelines, by the way, 70% of your water supply in New York City is carried by cast iron pipelines. So relationships like this are meaningful because they actually take earthquake data and transform it into a usable format for any source of ground deformation. Pipelines j just aren't damaged by deformation caused by an earthquake, they're caused by plane deformation. And with these kinds of technologies and these kinds of databases, people can come up with fundamental relationships that affect infrastructure, generally speaking. Performance. The water supply in Christchurch involves 1,700 kilometers of primarily jointed pipelines. Cast iron pipelines, asbestos cement pipelines, polyvinyl chloride pipelines, all of which can pull out at the joints. What you see on the right hand of that screen 
is the damage, 1,700 different locations for the 22nd February earthquake superimposed on the 1,700 kilometers of pipelines in the water supply. When we add up all the four main earthquakes of the Canterbury earthquake sequence, we're talking about 3,500 repairs to that jointed pipeline system. When we compare that to a smaller system, which happens to be the gas distribution system, same diameter pipelines, same pressures. But the main difference is that this is composed of medium and high density polyethylene, which is thermally fused, welded. Over the four earthquakes, there wasn't one damage, not one repair. So if you ever needed an illustration for ductility, improving the performance of infrastructure, you certainly found it in Christchurch. Wastewater system, again, about 1,700 repairs to about 1,700 kilometers of pipelines. And what you see in this picture are those repairs superimposed on those pipelines. You also see the Bromley treatment plant, the only sewage treatment plant for Christchurch, which was damaged not only by liquefaction at the site, but by wastewater coming into that site carrying all sorts of fine-grained grit materials and so forth which messed up the primary treatment, the secondary treatment, and then liquefaction caused failure of the, uh, the embankments in the, uh, the lagoons and therefore affected the tertiary treatment plant. They came very, very close and had to do some very creative things to keep that plant operating. But the really interesting story here is this, that to repair a sewer line or to repair something that runs primarily by gravity drainage, you have to, in soils that have water at about a one meter depth, dig a trench that would be four to five meters. Now you have to dewater it, you have to put some form of a box structure in there or steel sheet piles, and the costs are enormous. There was a local uh, authority protection plan uh, insurance system that was in place to provide disaster support for municipalities and councils in New Zealand before the Christchurch earthquake. It went bankrupt because of other things, among other things, the enormous cost of repairing and trying to fix the wastewater system. Very interesting that this would be such a critical piece of infrastructure and carry such an enormous financial burden. And then electric power supply. Uh, Christchurch gets its power from TransPower uh, from the 22 uh, kilovolt lines which come through the Bromley uh, substation. Uh, and then it goes in sub uh, transmission lines, uh, 62 kV lines, and is distributed through portions of Christchurch. Uh, after the 22nd February earthquake, 50% of those cables were failed, about 4,300 different repairs, a very important impact uh, with respect to uh, underground power supplies, which New York has plenty of, and so, so do many other cities. One of the applications for all of these data sets was for the Ministry of Business, Innovation, and Employment to create residential technical categories that would be for planning uh, the restoration of Christchurch and building uh, foundations. And Christchurch was divided into four different character, uh, characteristics of the ground, uh, TC1, TC2, and TC3, based on these observations and data sets. And then, of course, there were the red zones where there was an abandonment of land uh, led by the central uh, guidance uh, from uh, the central government. So use of these data sets to actually set up a planning scenario for what kind of foundations had to go into place and what kind of, of reconstruction would occur. Liquefaction land damage. These are some plots that uh, Shaud Van Balagoy uh, shared with me. Uh, we're looking at 51, 52,000 properties uh, observed with minor to severe liquefaction related land damage. Remember that in New Zealand they ensure the land against land damage. So being able to use this incredible data set, this spatially distributed data set, helps them and allows them to be able to adjudicate what kind of insurance payments are going to be made. Residential building damage ratios. This is the ratio of the cost of 
the damage relative to the initial cost of the structure. These, of course, will contribute to catastrophic loss estimation models. So are being used to obviously plan for future possibilities of, of damage and, and estimate losses in Christchurch and the rest of New Zealand. And this is just showing this spatial distribution of liquefaction severity number that John was talking about relative to the locations of water supply damage and then correlating this LSN with the actual repair rates to some of the pipeline system that you see. Remote sensing. There was high resolution satellite imagery used, there was LIDAR used, there was air photogrammetry used, providing for a very rich and interesting comparison among these different technologies in terms of being able to use them to evaluate what kind of ground deformations and impact on infrastructure would occur in the future. These data sets have been taken. They're currently being used in the earthquake safety and emergency response bonds that were passed in 2010 and 2014 in San Francisco. San Francisco has stepped up. Passing these two bond issues has resulted in $810 million to improve the infrastructure there and to rehabilitate the auxiliary water supply system, which is the backbone for fire protection in San Francisco. What we learned about liquefaction and the kinds of damage to the water network, water pipeline network, was directly imported into the work associated with this bond issue to be able to set up modeling of pipeline, which is fire protection water uh, damage with respect to future earthquakes and to establish a hierarchy of projects to improve the infrastructure in San Francisco. Similarly, Los Angeles. All of Los Angeles' water uh, for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power both aqueducts one and two go through the Lake Elizabeth Tunnel, which of course crosses the San Andreas Fault. And there are measures in place to take this knowledge about the, uh, the high density polyethylene pipelines and actually provide a smaller diameter pipeline there, which if this tunnel ruptures and partially closes, that pipeline would continue to operate because of its ductility until, of course, it got squeezed off. So cutting down on the margin of risk exposure associated with the water supply in, in Los Angeles. Now, Hurricane Sandy has also taught us some extremely valuable, important things about distributed infrastructure and spatially distributed damage. Um, if we look at the metropolitan area of New York before Hurricane Sandy, and then look at the inundation which occurred as a consequence of Hurricane Sandy. Remember, uh, we had about a 12-foot storm surge and then a two-foot tide on top of that, so you've got 14 feet of water coming into the metropolitan area of New York. And we concentrate a little bit here on, oops, sorry, going the wrong way. Let's go back again. And then here's some, we'll look at lower Manhattan. So we've got the battery here, got the Brooklyn Bridge, got the World Trade Center, which is underwater, mind you, and that is where 140 West Street is, is located. That's the main Verizon building for all of the security trades that go into the New York Stock Exchange. They had a separate uh, Verizon unit on Broad Street, which I think will show up here in a minute, and that also was underwater, and actually what they had to do is to restore the flooded sections of the two Verizon uh, main facilities in order to get the stock exchange back and running. And it turns out that the, the, they had moved their diesel generators from the basements, but unfortunately the, the, water, uh, the water pumps and the tanks were still in the basements, and a tank is always partially uh, uh, full, and so it's going to float. And, uh, and also that floated and banged around uh, debris and so forth and cut off the lines. They eventually had to bring uh, power units in to the street and actually get the generators which powered up which were located on the 10th floor. Um, if we take the location of inundation, we superimpose it on the metro system, you can see what the consequences of Hurricane Sandy were. And if we take a look at them with respect to flooded tunnels, you had seven subway tunnels, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, Midtown Tunnel, Path Tunnels, Holland Tunnel, Amtrak East and Amtrak North flooded. Of course, that had a profound effect on transportation with respect to the uh, underground system in New York. And then finally, 
Uh, we also had flooding during Hurricane Sandy of the 138 KV station on 14th Street of Con Edison. As a consequence of that, Con Edison preemptorily shut down the electric power supply in the lower part of Manhattan. And then, of course, they have a steam distribution system when a steam line, which is running at 200 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit and from 200 to 300 PSI internal pressure, gets cooled, it develops a bubble because of condensation, and that bubble can cause the lines to explode. So those had to be shut down also. So clearly, New York City has understood and has gone through some of the consequences of distributed hazards and distributed infrastructure. So let's take a look at the Canterbury earthquake sequence data sets. They provide a spatial, time-dependent assessment of damage. They provide a spatial assessment of hazards, in fact, multi-hazards, because not only contained in those data sets do we find earthquake hazard information, but we also find flooding hazard information. They allow us to do land use planning. They allow for insurance settlements. They allow for catastrophic loss estimation, and they allow for infrastructure systems modeling. They are, in fact, immensely valuable for recovery and continuing asset management. Once these are in place, they become living tools, not only to learn from the past, but also to manage your spatially distributed infrastructure in the future. So perhaps the main lessons for hazard resilient infrastructure are that we should take a page from their playbook and create an integrated infrastructure asset management platform after and before these hazards and disasters. In fact, I think we're at a point in our technology when we actually can create a building information model for spatially distributed infrastructure combining both the built and natural environments. There's no reason you can't do that. There's no reason you can't create layers that you can enter and subtract from and have different security levels at various levels to address security concerns. Certainly computational power is not a problem anymore. Certainly our ability to sense the environment spatially is not as big a problem as it used to be. So this allows for harmonized inventories of facilities, subsurface geotechnical conditions and hazards all combined into one. It is actually possible in the future to um, have a printout of some infrastructure location showing the subsurface environment and also the physical and natural environment around it. I was always impressed by the rehabilitation of Victoria Station where they actually created a printout of the subsurface infrastructure for that because they put it into a BIM model and actually could print out these things and you really then could see the three-dimensional aspects. So the benefits are spatially integrated land use planning, spatially integrated assessment of codes and standards for regulatory guidance, and then operational and capital, capital expenditure budgeting, things which we dearly and, and, and very much need in infrastructure management. There's a New York City resilience plan that was published after Hurricane Sandy, and it contains a very important lesson. And that is to actually implement changes in infrastructure, we have to think at the community level. And so that plan actually calls for looking at New York City not as one collective behemoth, but as looking at New York City as a series of communities with their own concerns, their own needs, their own metrics, their own expectations. And so but community by community, one can actually define the hazard, in this case for flooding. One can actually then locate what is the critical infrastructure. Remember, the infrastructure that's too big to fail is the one that's too big to fail for you in your community. So it's best locally that you define what that is and then take steps to repair it and, and to keep it working properly. And then finally, one can put together a plan but now, since you engage the community at the grassroots level, this is a plan that everyone is behind. So finally, I'm going to end with communities uh, talking about the great advantages that we've learned from Christchurch in creating these data sets and asset management models, but leaving it in terms of implementation to communities because it takes a village to make a recovery. It actually takes a village to make a village, and I know that... Uh, 
that uh, if we say something like that, we're going to be focusing on the core of what infrastructure is. Because a subsidiary statement that I could give you right now is it takes a village to make infrastructure. Infrastructure needs to be implemented with respect to community values and then be united with respect to our modern data gathering and technological bases for managing our spatially distributed infrastructure. Thanks very much.